Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, just to let you know, my name is Carly. I am hosting this webinar. If you guys have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat section and um, we will get to it. We will either answer it periodically through the webinar or at the very end. Um, we encourage you guys to take as many notes as you can. We will be going over a lot of items. So if you guys miss anything or have additional questions, feel free to email us or we will be posting this on our InnoTech University site or our YouTube page that you can go ahead and watch it again. And this recording will also be sent in the email follow-up. Um, yeah, so we will actually be covering inverters, different types of inverters. So if you guys have any questions, like I said, feel free to put them in the chat section. If for some reason you can't get your control panel to work, there should be a button to where you can raise your hand and that will let us know that you guys have an issue. So let's go ahead and begin. Thanks, Carly. Uh, today, uh, again, John Pendleton, if you guys haven't been in these webinars yet, um, or if you have, you've probably seen the picture already. Again, I work in tech support and I'm the uh, senior trainer at Intertech, uh, mainly just hand handling the trainings at this point. I mean, I do help out with the uh, tech support, but especially with this uh, virus thing going on, working remote, um, really focusing on the trainings and webinars and things. Uh, definitely check out our uh, Intertech University website. On there, you can click on the online video library tab, and that'll take you over to our uh, YouTube channel, so you can look at these webinars or any any webinars or trainings that we have uh, videos of. So if you need anything from me, you can contact me here, or you can also contact uh, training at intertechgeo.com as well. Uh, both those accounts go to me. So if you have any questions, uh, send them over. And if I don't have the answers, I'll figure them out and I'll get them from someone and get back to you. Uh, we got Kyle Smith on here today as well. He's our solar sales and energy storage manager. Uh, he's been a great help for me setting up these trainings and uh, you know, kind of in teaching me and instructing me. And I've uh, been in the field a little bit with him on some installs on solar. So uh, he's been a, a great asset to me. As in, if you guys have done any of the solar, I'm sure he's uh, helped you guys out greatly as well. So I know he's always pretty busy and uh, like all of us, but uh, he's always putting a lot of effort in. So uh, we appreciate Kyle's help. Do I get five bucks? <laughs> Again, this is our team in design. Uh, a lot of you guys may know Jim Cusack. He was the TM for Minnesota area, and he gets around quite a bit. So um, he's pretty pretty popular guy. Uh, then we also have Zach Sl Slatten. Zach works with uh, Kyle on installs and and stuff quite a, uh, quite a bit as well. And he'll probably be helping out doing some trainings and things uh, as well. Especially when we get if we ever get back to the situation where we're doing some in person trainings where we got some hands on and stuff. Zach will be a good uh, asset for that. And then we've got Angelique and Jeremy uh, back in design services, and they do designs for geo, uh, geothermal as well as the solar. We have one other gentleman that works remotely uh, part time that helps them out as well. Um, so if you guys have any design needs, uh, please email design services. That's usually the best way to get through to design services. Uh, is email, that way you can email the information that they're going to need and uh, they'll get back to you. So again, we offer uh, residential and commercial services, uh, you know, for your roof mounts, your ground mounts, your installation support. Obviously, we have training and design uh, and job site delivery as well. So today we're going to be covering the string inverters, micro inverters, and the power optimizers. Sorry about that. Uh, the inverters, micro inverters, and power optimizers are all here on this picture here. So we've got the Solark, the great big gray one here. That is a, uh, a, a string inverter. Then we've got your solar edge, which is the uh, to the right of that solar, 
in the upper uh, upper portion of it. That's the solar edge. And then below that, we have the Feronius inverters. And Feronius has like three or four different inverters as well, and we'll cover those. And then the little black boxes to the far right, those are the micro inverters um, from AP systems. And with those micro inverters, there's also some communication and things, and uh, we'll kind of basically cover that as well. The inverters convert the DC electricity from your solar panels into AC electricity. So again, there's three inverter options available for home, residential, and commercial solar installations. And then there's string, micro inverters, and also power optimizers. And we'll talk about the power optimizers as well um, going forward here. Micro inverters and power optimizers are more expensive than string inverters, but depending on your application and shading and things like that, um, there are times when we're gonna need to use those micro inverters and power optimizers. But not every job will need that application. This is a micro inverter setup. Uh, so on these micro inverters, they're just having one micro inverter per panel. And so basically, the, or module, I should say. So the solar, mod, solar module goes into the micro inverter and the micro inverter goes back into, uh, back to your AC connection. This would be considered a string inverter setup. Uh, so we've got on the top figure, the circuit is connected in series um, using a daisy chain wiring. And then the, the second one is using a leapfrog. Leapfrog just helps save on a little bit of wire. You're doing this exact same thing, um, mm -hmm. but it just it helps on save a little bit of wire using the tails of the modules and slash the uh, optimizers. and it also helps, uh, I guess, in a little bit of time, too, just to not have to bundle up as much wire either. This is basically just the kind of the um, setup. This is showing a solar edge inverter. So you've got your modules or your panels. And then so the panels are obviously DC. The solar edge converts it to AC. Then you've got your disconnect and your service panel and then back to your grid. So this is basically the line layout uh, of your system. Inverter voltages. So we do offer single phase 240 volt. Uh, and then we also have three phase with the high leg being 240. We have uh, three phase 208 and we have three phase 480. So when you're designing this system, make sure that if you're working with our design team that we know exactly what that voltage is uh, because we're going to have to get the proper um, inverter for that and we're going to have to set up the proper voltage for it as well so uh, we don't obviously want to use a single phase inverter on a three phase design so uh, it's not going to work real well and then also we have to get the proper three phase voltage again we have 208, we have 240, and we have 480. So um, make sure we always know the proper voltage in the home or what the what you're looking for. Uh, on you that one, on okay. that one, there is limitations to sizes. So you know it's the old rule of a voltage and amperage. Um, so your voltage goes up, your amps go down. So therefore, uh, the sizes of inverters are a lot bigger in 480 and then 208, for example. And we really ha can do high leg uh, stuff, but likely it's, uh, even in some commercial applications, it, we may be better off to do a, a, a step up transformer. I can't know, I don't remember if you call that step up or step down, but let's do a transformer to take us from either high leg or 208 just take us to 480 there on site for the solar array and then we can come back in 
um, to our voltage after the transformer. So that's going to be on commercial, but uh, it's just some some information we want to share with you. As in, in addition, we need to have a Y transformer set up uh, as well. So uh, anyway, that's all I wanted to add in there, John. Okay, thanks. Uh, we'll start off with the Feronius inverters. So the Feronius has the Primo, which is on the far left, and the little blue one is the IG. And then to the lower left of the Feronius IG is the IG plus. And then on the far right is the CL. That CL, that's the commercial uh, inverter right there. So it's obviously a lot bigger. Uh, so those are the four from Fronius. Uh, on the Fronius, the inverter mounting location, obviously they can be mounted outside. They're watertight, or they should be. Um, apparently you cannot mount them higher than 13,123 feet in the air. Um, shouldn't have really that much of a problem, uh, especially here in Illinois. Uh, but make sure we're not installing them inside of a greenhouse where it can get real hot. Uh, don't install it in the living space. And direct sunlight is not really a, the greatest place for it either. And no uh, cattle barns or on the side of the home. Uh, you can mount, if you have a ground mount, you can mount it on one of the poles underneath. I've seen that quite a bit. Um, so again, it can be mounted outside, just not in direct uh, line of the sun. It'll end up getting too hot inside of there, and that's when transformers start failing and things overheat, and it goes into overload and that kind of thing. So uh, the inverter orientation. So you can see how we want it mounted. So you're going to want it basically horizontal on a wall or vertical um totally flat nothing really in between no upside down no sideways no you know upside uh, inverted nothing like that so basically just those four on the right uh you can have a slight angle as long as it's uh going up uh, but that's just about just about it clearance and air flows obviously there's with electricity, there's heat involved. So I want, want to make sure we get clearance. Uh, if you've got multiple boxes, make sure you've got four inch minimum in between them. And then uh, make sure we've got eight inches above it. <clears throat> Depending on obviously whether it's the, uh, the 10 to 15 or the 3.8 to 8.2, uh, there's a couple inches difference, but just know we've got to have some clearance uh, for one to run wiring and for two to dissipate some of the heat from the inverter itself. Conduit knockouts. Knockouts are fun, I know. Sometimes they knock out, sometimes they don't. Normally they don't. So uh, they do have knockouts. If you're knocking them out, I would prefer that you knock from the inside out rather than from the outside in. That way if your screwdriver or whatever kind of slips, it doesn't hit anything else inside that, uh, that connection box. And none of the little plastic pieces or whatever that might break off uh, don't get stuck in there somewhere where you really don't want them. So um, again, I would prefer that you knock it out from the out, inside out. You can also use a unibit if for some reason it doesn't want to come out. Uh, I've dealt with knockouts you know, my whole career, and I'm sure you guys have as well. Uh, they're just not a whole lot of fun sometimes. It's like they don't stamp them out enough, and you know, you need a three-quarter, and a one-inch knockout comes out instead. So sometimes a unibit uh, will work a little bit better for you. But basically, your, your voltage wiring is going to come in the bottom uh, of it. Uh, you, you can see you've got your uh, four aug wire come down there in the bottom. And your communication wires so more than likely come in on the, on the side of the uh, CMO and the Primo 
uh, inverters. There you can see just some more knockouts. Again, you can use that unibit, or um, I would not use a drill bit. Uh, it's just not going to be quite big enough, but um, you can use a knockout. Just be careful that you're not, there's no wires you're going to hit or anything like that. So, uh, Conduit fittings, make sure all your conduit fittings are uh, rain tight. And there's a certain little area where that knockout is, and don't drill a bigger hole because you got a bigger box. If it doesn't fit in that hole, you probably need to get a bigger or a smaller box because we don't want to exceed that area where that knockout is because there's a potential of electrical wires being right behind there that will get in the way. So uh, just be careful when you're mounting that electrical box on the side of the inverter and always use rain, rain tight conduit fittings. The, there is a ground bushing inside the control panel. We want that ground wire. Uh, we either want it in the 12 o'clock, the 9 o'clock, or the 6 o'clock position. Uh, and we want it to have a little bit of a curl to it. It takes less strain off. It takes strain off of the wiring when it's wired in this, this way. Um, so you can see the wrong way to run it. We don't want to run it all the way across. That's the control box where all the connections come in on the bottom. You can kind of see a knockout there with that green wires coming across it. So we don't want that in the way of our electrical wiring. So make sure we have it in the six, nine or 12 o'clock position. Conductor sizing for all the uh, Fronius inverters, DC conductor size is going to be anywhere from a 14 to a 6, and that can be copper solid or a stranded wire. Uh, they don't uh, require just solid or just stranded. It can be either or. Excuse me. The AC conductors are going to be a 14 through 6 uh, for the smaller inverters, and then the bigger ones are going to be a 10 through a 2, which is the Primo uh, 10 through 15 kW on the AC. And then also on the AC conductors, you can use aluminum wire. Uh, that's totally up to you if you want to use aluminum wire or not. But all DC wiring needs to be copper. These are your terminal blocks. Again, the wire is going to come up from the bottom, uh, tie in. If you look really close, you can probably see over there on the uh, left picture, you see your L1, your N, and your ground symbol. Uh, then you've got over towards the left, you can see like a, a couple plus or like four pluses and four minuses, and that'll be your DC um, voltage or DC coming into it. Combining wires, there are uh, bus bars included with every uh, uh, inverter. If you've got the Primo 10 to 15 kW, you will have to add those on, but uh, there is a bus bar that basically is going to combine those two uh, back uh, at the uh, at the controller itself. You can kind of see in the picture to the uh, right, you can see that little one, two little jumper bar there. Here's a wiring example on a six string. This is a Primo 10 to 15 kW. Uh, the blue are the, uh, or your DC wiring there. And you, so you, they've got, they're using, uh, looks like the RBS Duo uh, power optimizers. And those power optimizers are two to one ratio. So you can use two modules per power optimizer. There's also some that have four, uh, four to one ratio. Uh, these happen to be the uh, two. So it goes into the power optimizer and then goes back into the, uh, into the inverter. The uh, Fronius inverters, they all have a rapid shutdown. And so make sure that we're, uh, there is a little 
box you're going to need. You can see the little elbow there. Uh, the knockout size is three quarter inch. The uh, box has a hole for one inch conduit. So we do have a bushing that you can use to reduce that down to the three quarter inch. And make sure again that all your connections that are watertight. Uh, make sure you're reducing washer is watertight. All of it's watertight. Obviously, it's even more important when you set it outside because uh, it could get rained on and we don't. It's electricity, so we want to make sure that we're always using watertight connections and we're always putting the door back on properly uh, so that it seals it from the elements. I've seen a couple, John, where uh, the, somebody put a a lightning arrestor or a conduit on the side of the inverter like an lb coming in and we had a, had some drencher rains and something about that that item not seating right um coming into the inverter it didn't seal up and the uh, body of the inverter down there with all the wiring filled up with water and fried the inverter so yeah, it's best, if at all possible, to come up from the bottom, um, if if you can do so. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it does sound like the inverter has a little drain in the bottom of it, and it's a basically a plastic container. So um, you get a little bit, of, you start getting water in there. It's going to start cooling all the way down by your AC and DC wires, and then once obviously it gets far enough up the box, it's going to complete the circuit and things are not going to be good. So um, the lightning rest arresters, I'm not really going to talk about those today, but um, me personally, I have positive and negative feelings about those. But um, for one, there's the leak possibility. And two, I have seen arrays get hit by lightning and then it took out everything. So it didn't really seem to be the sacrificial lamb, but I think that was actually a direct hit. And that was actually one of our guys uh, in our model shop out of his place. He only had it in for not real long and we had a big storm and it came through and hit, uh, took out his inverter. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what all it took out, but it took out quite a bit. I'm, I think I've actually got a picture of his inverter here uh, going, on farther down when we get to the solar edge uh and you can't tell that it got hit by lightning but um but yeah it definitely smoked it hard to get that smoke back in once you let it out my opinion on them is is that it's a, a little bit of a a warranty feel good i guess you could say just in just in case something would go wrong with the inverter and the manufacturers might kick back at you with something it's you know for what the cost it's pretty uh, minimal to to keep them on there um and then another thing that i've seen lately about probably five projects now uh where we had some grid irregularities i guess i'll call it um with high voltage uh coming from the grid and uh, at some points the light the ac lightning arrestor can actually absorb some of that high voltage uh, spurts uh, and help with that too so um but you know to each his own and you don't have to use them but that's just gave you two trains of thought and uh just kind of our opinions so wire management uh we would prefer to have a wire loop You know, so you can kind of see those pictures and see what we're kind of looking for. Don't leave them right in front of that little, the where you connect the wire to power in. Uh, it'll be you'll have a hard time getting the door back on if you leave those wires like that. Uh, and I know that just from experience in the field, um, putting these back on, it's best to try to tuck those wires up out of the way. There are torque values for the different terminals as well. Again, I'm not going to get into the torque values today. In the manual, when you get it, one of the first sheets in that manual will be the torque specs for every single nut and bolt in there. So uh, just check out those torque specs and make sure you're torquing it properly. Don't just use your impact, your, your cordless impact, the driver to tighten everything down. 
you'll strip things out and cause just more problems for yourself. So, uh, DC polarity and DC voltage. Uh, you're going to have to check polarity to make sure you've got everything wired in properly once you get it all set up. So you can check polarity uh, with your meter and see uh, make sure you've got proper polarity. And you can kind of see we've got PV1 and PV2 on the left there um, and how we're wiring it in basically back to the terminal there. Once these panels are up in the air, uh, they will start producing DC power immediately. So uh, you may even see some DC voltage on there. You can daisy chain multiple inverters. So if you've got, you know, I know uh, an example at Intertech, you know, we're putting up a bunch of solar panels in here in Illinois, and we have a whole like room. We're not using Fronius, we're using Solar Edge, but we've got numerous inverters mounted on the wall, and then you have combiner boxes for those. Um, so they kind of work work together basically. So Again, we can put multiple inverters together to complete your array. And that's normally gonna be on obviously bigger commercial type applications. Inverter installation, uh, basically there's a little hinge on the top. There's some uh, torque bolts or Allen bolts at the bottom and you'll remove those and then it'll just swing up and you can pop the door off the top. Make sure that you've got it in the off position on the switch or else it won't open up. Uh, so you have to turn it off, pull those bolts out, and then it'll swing up and you can pull the top off. After you've got those bottom bolts out and it swivels up, the top two uh, mounts, the th number three in that picture will just slide right up off the top of it. It's pretty easy to take it off. Just remember, you got to put it in the off position. There are some startup procedures for these. Uh, I'm not going to get real in depth with these today, mainly because it'll walk you through uh, in the manual as well on the screen to help you uh, do the startup. But it's basically, you know, like anything else, it's going to ask you what language and country you want to use. You're going to set your time and your date. Um, and then, hey Kyle, what is the MPPT2 on off? So that's the second source of the maximum power point tracker. And that will be the, uh, the second source for the PV to be able to come into the inverter. Okay. Thank you. The, uh, if you ever have to go back in, uh, maybe you put the wrong time or something, you can re-enter the startup, just turn off the uh, AC power to the inverter and turn it back on and it'll take you back to the main screen and you can set up all that stuff again. Uh, the DATCOM cover is on the bottom of it. So if you wanna put the DATCOM cover on, uh, basically there's a couple uh, nuts or bolts there. It just snaps on and there's two bolts that'll tighten on. Again, don't tighten those down too much or you'll break the plastic on the actual cover there. And it'll just kind of uh, hinge and snap into place. It'll make a little click. Then you can tighten your little TX25 uh, bolts down there. Obviously, make sure that it's closed up all the way or again, water can get in there. Um, or, and so don't leave it off. For a long period of time, or don't you know leave for a week and leave that bot that off. Make sure you always put it back on. It's easy to put on and off, um, so just don't leave it exposed, especially if there's a chance that water can get into it. The other uh, uh, inverters, the one we were just talking about was the Primo and the and the Simo. Now we've got the IG, the IG Plus, and the CL. And you can see the the different KW ranges for them. So the IG is two to five roughly, and obviously a single phase. The IG plus is probably the one we're gonna see the most of if we're using the Peronius product. 
and that's going to be a 3 to 12 kilowatt. And then obviously the commercial uh, Fronius inverter is a three phase, and that's 33 to 60 uh, kW. Here's the product range. Again, these are all single phase units, so different sizing on those uh, inverters, just depending on your array. Here is a open up, opened up view of the inverter. This would be the IG. It's got a power stage, uh, two power stages in it. You can see basically the upper and lower have the same board in it. And so this is more of a stage type setup. And then you've got your control board and your inputs down the lower left corner. You can see the little disconnects right there, the fuse looking uh, disconnect there. So that's where all your AC and DC wires and your control wires are going to go into the box at. Excuse me. The CL, it's just a big IG, uh, except it will use a 208, 240 uh, Delta configuration. So we've got 33. KW 44, 55 on the Delta configuration and the 277Y configuration is 36 kilowatt, 48 kilowatt, or 60 kilowatt. Each of these, so if you have, you know, on this picture here, you've got the two, each of those is going to have a 30 amp fuse. It'll have a ground fault fuse of two or three amps. It will show uh, fan code errors on there because this is, does have a fan in there on the commercial side to keep things cool. You can basically see it right there on the front of it. When replacing the basically the, the board on it, you've got to pull the jumper from the old board uh, and put it on the new board. So just a quick little note on that. And you can also, uh, the power stages can be moved around for troubleshooting. So if you've got your first stage for some reason is not working and not turning on the second, you can actually switch them up and see if maybe it's just a board issue or something like that. There's no side distance specs, um, but make sure you have a plan to vent that air, that hot air. But yeah, as long as you've got a place to vent it out to the back or the front or whatever, uh, you could actually put them right next to each other with no clearance at all. With the other, almost all the other inverters, uh, you'll have to have some clearance on the sides in order to vent that 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 uh, hot air. Again, here is the connection compartment. You've got your neutral and your grounding there. Uh, your DC breaker is 40 amp. AC breaker is a 32. Obviously, depending on the phase type, will depend on. Uh, how you're going to wire in, usually between 8 and 10 aug wire, and then 4 to 14 on the DC wiring. And you can see we've got the little terminal block there for your DC uh, wiring. Then you've got your ground fault fuse there, a little uh, uh, screw-in fuse, uh, 1 amp, 600 volt. Then you've got your board card inverter display and your DATCOM slots over there to the right. Monitoring the grid. So on these, you can monitor it by the inverter. So it monitors the main voltage, minimum and maximum, and the grid frequency, minimum, minimum and maximum. And I'm not really sure what they mean by anti-islanding measurement. Any insight on that, Kyle? Uh, negative. I can't. I know that, and I've heard of it, and I know it. I just can't remember what an island islanding is defined as. Um, I'll have to look that up when I get a chance. Yes. Uh, you can also uh, monitor it with the GFDI card, and it's basically going to measure voltage between phase to neutral and the ground fault uh, fuse measurement. 
and negative, make sure you, uh, the negative is grounded out of the, out of the box. Again, this is your system monitoring board. Just a little bit, uh, uh, show you where it's located in that, uh, in that inverter. Again, this is all your connections, L1, L2, L3, your neutral, and then your DCs. AP systems, these are micro inverters here. Uh, so the AP systems, we can use the YC600, which we kind of talked about it earlier when we were talking about micro inverters and the stringing uh, in the panels. This is a two to one ratio on the YSD 600s. The QS1 is a four to one ratio. And then I'm not really quite sure on the YC1000. The YC1000 is the commercial uh, micro inverter. Well, the YC1000 is actually a four to one, but it's dependent upon um, wattage of the module, the total wattage of the modules coming in. So um, recently we did a project where I think it was 208 voltage and using 370, 370 watt modules, we could only do use three of the ports um, or the incoming ports on the uh, YC1000. So there's a there's a, a, a range limit um, to what's uh, available. Uh, Microinverters, conventional string systems only operate it as efficiently as efficiently as the lowest performing module. Basically meaning that the reduced output caused, caused by shade, uh, leaves, dust, snow, uh, it, basically it's going to cut output. Obviously, if the sun's not getting to it, it's not going to output as much voltage. So the microinverter technology individually monitors and maximizes the power generation for each module in the array. So basically, it's going to boost the system efficiency by up to 20%. So each microinverter handles multiple PV modules, uh, lowering logistics, installation, and balance of system costs. And all the micro, all the uh, microinverters are engineered uh, to comply with the requirements for rapid shutdown. So rapid shutdown is basically to shut the system down quickly for system installers as well as any kind of emergency funders. Uh, let me expand upon that one because uh, I have a, a good segue here. Uh, Scott helped us out on the anti-islanding protection. I never, I always knew it, never really thought of it as a term, but um, the anti-islanding is basically saying a grid tied inverter. And when we have a grid tied inverter, it has to feel a pure sine wave coming from the grid to stay on. Therefore, when a, a generator comes on, for example, at a site, the inverter will turn off because the sine wave on that inverter is too loopy and will quickly turn off. That is you know, part of the equation. Um, all grid-tied inverters have that built-in technology um, into the, every single one of them. Now, the rapid shutdown side of that, though, is, is that depending on the code, uh, 14 or 17, says that, uh, I, I'm not going to be exactly specific, but I, I think that 14, I think I can be actually, I think 14 says is that you have to have rapid shutdown within 10 feet um, of the array itself coming from the DC solar, uh, the DC side of the solar modules themselves. So that's more uh, first responder protection um, in mind. And now when you get to 17 though, <clears throat> I believe that it has to be within three feet. It could be a foot and a half. Um, I'm not exactly sure, but it's a whole lot closer. Therefore, when we have um, rapid shutdown uh, needed on the roof itself, we're trying, we're eliminating the PV the modules from sending DC power to a source. 
So the optimizers with uh, Solar Edge um, or the uh, rapid shutdown gateways, I guess I'll call them, um, that are also available. But what AP Systems has automatically built in is, is that rapid shutdown because they mount directly underneath the panels. So therefore, it's nothing you have to even consider. It's just built in and part of the equation every single time. Again, micro inverter components. Um, we have, a, again, the YC600, the QS1, and the YC1000. And then you're also going to have to have, over to the right, you've got your communication and your monitoring. Uh, so these are going to tie back in to your micro inverters. Again, the YC600 is a two to one ratio. Um, 60 and 72 cell PV modules. Uh, there's basically the output data, a bunch of numbers and things like that. But this is- On this one, John, I, I threw this one in there. Um, so uh, the, the YC600 is, uh, I get the two to one ratio. So, it is really good for laying out modules uh, on a roof and definitely when modules are in landscape uh, because the tails of the modules, just depending on how long those are, um, you get more AC trunk line in between uh, these eight, uh, YC600s. But in comparison to the next slide, when we go to the QS1s, they are a little, a hair more expensive than the uh, QS1s. So, on the YC uh, 600s, though, they are one of our, uh, you know, I guess our best seller probably at this point of the YC, uh, of the micro inverters. And I do want everybody to let you know, I mean, in, in my opinion, AP Systems is uh, preference uh, for installations. They're, uh, micro inverters are basically the, the DIY option um, or preferred option if somebody was to buy solar offline or something like that. Um, Meaning to me is what I'm saying is is that they're really easy to work with and they're really easy to handle um, to mount up underneath the modules themselves. You're sending a trunk line as we call it AC power down, but really it's an outdoor rated uh, three conductor wire that's uh, number ten, so everybody can handle it. And uh, once you penetrate inside the roof. You can either go to a junk, you go to a junction box or a sub panel of some sort. Um, but with the 600s, in this case, going to the uh, the total, the at 240 volts, your continuous output power is at 548. So that's how we measure the size, the AC size of these little micro inverters. And in my, you know, what we do in design services is divide 548 by two and that tells us our ac power output per panel and from there we can start to figure up our ac to uh, dc to ac size ratio uh, as well um, and kind of tell us how big a modules uh, we want to put on there uh, too john so um if you might could you go to the qs1 now on this one, it's a four to one ratio. So the maximum continuous output power on this one underneath the output data there is a 1200. But since this is a four to one ratio, that puts the AC power continuous at 300 uh, watts. So it's uh, quite a bit better and the preferred method for the larger wattage of modules that we have uh, Kind of hit starting to hit the streets right now um, we have the 385 watt modules that this would definitely go in well with uh, and then 400s coming in soon too so uh, this is a, a newer product for ap systems and i will let everybody know too while i'm uh, kind of soapboxing and on about them is that they we've never had a failure with ap systems so we're really liking their products. We're really liking their people. Um, 
and in my opinion at this point they're if it's a roof mount or a close ground mount they're kind of the way to go you're gonna go to the next one so then the yc1000 that can be operated in a 208 voltage option or a 480 option and again you just they're they're designed so that you can bring in for up to four modules but you don't necessarily get to use all four locations uh, there are the um, inputs on the inverter for four modules so it may depend on if we're using 60 cell or 72 cell and what's our total wattage going into that micro inverter on this one I just wanted to throw in a slide on here on the features and benefits of micro inverters we but between labor and the cost of the material we pretty well see that micro inverters are about 20 percent less than a string op, a string inverter with optimizers um, so that's just something to consider they also save quite a bit of labor because you're getting everything up on the roof and quickly plugging everything in uh, wiring it back coming back down to a junction box or again or a, a sub panel of some sort they include the rapid shutdown that we talked about but for the lower price they also are module level monitoring so whenever a homeowner you or your homeowner or a facility owner um, is able to take a look at your app on your phone to see what your production is for the day you can see specifically each module and how it's performing Another benefit is, is that you're looking at low voltage AC coming down off the roof versus high wattage uh, DC from a long string coming down the roof um, with a string inverter or string inverter with optimizers. Just talked about mounting. I'll skip over that one. But the last one, in, in my opinion, you're not mounting up a large inverter up on a wall somewhere or on a post and they are going right up underneath the panels they they um, we use t-bolts to bolt them right to the rail or the railless foot and they're really fast option i think i may have a picture of uh no i guess not uh, this is one I did want to throw in here. Just a couple of cons, though. I mean, everything has got its pros and cons, which is why we sell all three brands. Um, a little bit of preference, but there's you need to have. We feel like we need to have a string inverter line. We need to have a micro inverter line, and then we need to have a string inverter with optimizers line. So, AP Systems is a great product. It just doesn't fit necessarily in all situations. It's uh, great for it's not great for all ground mounts because if we have multiple trunk lines coming in on those ground mounts, we're going to have to have an AC combiner pa panel, otherwise otherwise known as a sub panel, and it's going to look likely have to be located out on the array, and you'll be running a bunch of AC higher. Um, I'm sorry, let's just say bigger size of AC wire coming back to your um, meter location but with a roof mount though you every trunk line no matter what ground or roof has to have a 20 amp bre dual pole breaker uh, to protect the uh, trunk that it's on so we can't exceed uh, 20 amps of total in inverters so we can either do a AC combiner panel inside the, the location or we can put on this rail here on the um, solar deck that is a junction box that is also a roof penetration. And right on the rail there, we can actually add breakers um, to protect each trunk line coming into that line. So just a little bit of uh, you know a little bit of design and strategy into micro inverters versus string inverters on what's the best approach for the application. Uh, solar edge inverters, um, they will have power optimizers. We'll come back to that picture I just showed here in just a second. Uh, but again, you're going to have power optimizers uh, for the solar edge components. They'll be mounted on the roof as well. 
Uh, they're basically a DC to Z DC converter, uh, connects the PV modules in order to maximize the power harvesting um, or the MPPT at the module level. Basically, they're gonna regulate the string voltage at a constant level, regardless of length or you know shading or snow or any kind of environmental conditions. Uh, they do include a safety voltage function that automatically reduces the output of each power optimizer uh, to one volt DC during a fault condition uh, when the power optimizers are disconnected from the inverter. When the inverter switch is turned to the off position, when the AC breaker is turned off, uh, and then each power optimizer also transmits uh, modular module performance data uh, over the DC line to the inverter. Uh, again, there's two types of power optimizers. There's the module add-on power optimizer, and it uh, can be connected to one or more modules. And then we have the smart module, uh, which the power optimizer is embedded in the module itself. So this is the solar edge inverter here, showing the basically where your wires are coming in. You've got your uh, LEDs, and we'll come back to the LED here in a minute. And you can see the little red switch, that's gonna be your on off switch. The LEDs will actually, there's a, I don't know, a green or red and a, another one. Well, I think we'll come up through here in just a minute, but in the manual, it'll show different flashes and things and you can look and see what's going on with it so you can kind of monitor it but uh, basically this inverter is going to convert the dc power from the modules into ac power to be fed in, uh, to the main ac service on site the inverter also receives the monitoring data from each power optimizer and transmits it transmits it to uh your monitoring platform so you can look at it and see you know, is this panel only, you know, not outputting and, you know, it's only got 20% output and maybe, uh, you know, there's no shade or anything. So it may, you know, maybe you got a problem with that one or something, but so you can monitor what's going on with your system uh, with this solar edge inverter. Again, monitoring platform enables uh, the technician uh, or the uh, financial side of things to monitor it. Basically, it's going to provide past and present information on system performance, both at the system and at the module level. So you'll have a little Wi-Fi connector there, uh, USB connection, Ethernet. Here is actually the inverters at Intertech. You can see we don't have them quite wired in yet. They're putting panels on the roof. Uh, I know that they were doing it this week. I was there Monday, I think, and. Uh, they're still working on the roof on the roofs i should say we got more than one that they've been on but this is basically right next to our little training area and so we've got 15 solar edge uh, inverters and then we have five uh, combiners that they'll yep. all tie back in and communicate with each other and i think this is technically there is 15 individually there they're sold in uh, threes in this case. Mm -hmm. So these are actually Solar Edge uh, 100 kW inverters, and you have uh, one on uh, each second, two secondaries, and one primary on each inverter. So in this case, uh, our setup at Intertech will be a 500 kW AC, and this is at in our showroom, our training room, and we wanted to be able to bring them all back in inside to be able to train with them and show them kind of show them off and uh what a cool system can look yeah, like it'll be nice once uh gets all hooked up and ready and then we get through this virus thing and we'll have some in-person trainings and we can actually get some hands on right there with our inverter so it'll be nice to have the technicians and you know you guys be able to see and play around with, you know look at things for a little bit monitor some things and get a little bit better understanding of how they operate so yeah it looks looks really nice they've done a really 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 nice job 
We're also going to add a TV in uh, on a different wall to be able to show the monitoring um, uh, modules and daily production, monthly, you know, monthly production, annual production, uh, and just like somebody would be able to see it from their phone. Yep. So. Uh, I think we'll get in, you know, this in this session, we wanted to make sure we're concentrating on hardware side of inverters. And uh, later, uh, after the battery session next week, we'll start getting into specific manufacturer uh, trainings um, so that we can start talking about the monitoring and uh, the software side of the inverters as, as well as specific uh, hardware design from the manufacturers themselves. So yeah, we, um, we can more spend, to come. Yeah, we could spend uh, a whole day on one manufacturer's inverter on a training. So obviously you guys don't want to sit in a webinar for eight hours on one inverter, but we will, um, and we're probably going to be getting some of the, the manufacturers of these inverters as well. And we'll host a webinar and bring them along with us and then they'll help train us as well. So. Uh, after we get through the batteries next week, again, we'll start uh, pulling those people in. So definitely keep keep updated on our website uh, for new trainings and stuff. So here's a list, a little bit of uh, close up of that combiner box. Uh, mounting of the power optimizers. Uh, determine the power optimizer mounting location. Uh, they do have a mounting bracket on them, um, so you can mount it. If you got rails, they're real easy to mount. You just mount them on the rail. I think Kyle might have talked about that earlier, but um, make sure that wherever you mount it, that it's protected from direct sunlight. And uh, for frame-mounted optimizers, there will be instructions supplied with the optimizer as well. So if you're gonna mount it, you know, onto something else, just you know, drill a hole and and you know use uh, stainless steel bolts, nuts, and washers. Make sure that it's securely fastened; it's not loose, gonna flop around or anything. And make sure that when you mount these, especially if you're putting them underneath like the uh, the modules or the solar panels that you get the model and serial number or the serial number off of the um, optimizer and make a note of the location. Because you're gonna need that when you're uh, using your monitoring and things so you'll know which is which and you know where it's located and well, you know if it's not working, which area it's at, you know, you're not gonna go through and have to look at every single one. So make sure, and also for, I think it's for warranty purposes as well, but make sure we're always getting those serial numbers. Uh, I know Kyle just had like a piece of cardboard and he kind of drew out the array of solar and then put the serial numbers by every spot where they were located. So you kind of have a rough understanding once you get on the ground of where they're at on the roof. For each power optimizer, connect, can, Connect the plus output connector of the module to the plus input connector on the power optimizer. And then connect the minus output connector of the module to the minus input connector of the power optimizer. Now, I'm pretty sure that you can't really cross them because they have two different ends on them. Uh, so they won't, a negative won't go into a positive plug. So it makes it at least takes a little bit of the uh, uh, error out of it. You can construct uh, uh, parallel strings of unequal lengths. That's basically the number of power optimizers in each string does not have to be the same. The minimum and maximum string lengths are uh, specified in the power optimizer data sheet. So we got to make sure we don't you know, get outside of those ranges. But if we do have unequal lengths, it's not really going to affect the system. Uh, an example would be like the P400s. I think, uh, man, I want to say 8 to 15. So anywhere in between those ranges are just fine. You can have an 8 and 315, or um, yeah, uh, that would be too many. 
uh, an eight and you know, two fifteens or something um, in in that range. And that also deals with the maximum PowerPoint tracker that we spoke on earlier, um, because you know if you're on a roof, you're using Solar Edge, uh, you may or may not be able to fit the uh, you know roofs are cut up, I guess is what I'll say, and it just depends on the layout and if you have to jumper back to a string or not. It's just enough to get that minimum uh, voltage slash amperage coming back to the inverter uh, to keep it uh, running basically. Make sure you verify the proper optimize the power optimizer connections. Uh, so here in this example here, we've got the uh, optimizers connected in series. Uh, when the module is connected to a power optimizer, the power optimizer outputs a safe voltage of one volt DC. Therefore, the total string voltage should equal one volt times the number of power optimizers connected in the series. So if you have 10 power optimizers, then you should have 10 volts DC produced. Uh, obviously, if they're in, the panels are not in the sunlight, then they're not going to produce anything. So make sure that when you're checking that, that they are in the sunlight. And the power optimizer will only turn on if the PV module provides at least two watts to the power optimizer. So it's got to be the two watts for it actually basically turns on. It doesn't really turn on, but that's basically what it's doing. So if you need to verify the proper power optimizer connection, you can measure the voltage of each string individually before connecting it to the other strings or to the inverter. You can verify correct polarity by measuring the string polarity with a voltmeter. Uh, obviously, use a voltmeter with uh, a pretty low DC voltage measurement accuracy. Since the inverter is not yet operating, you may measure the string voltage, uh, obviously, and verify the correct polarity on the DC wires. So just make sure you got polarity hooked up properly. Just use a quick, quick little voltmeter, not not too uh, too big of a deal. When you're installing the inverter, it will come with a uh, U-shape or a, a, a mounting bracket there. Obviously, make sure that the surface you're mounting it on can handle the weight. Um, they're heavy these inverters are heavy they have a real big heat sink in the back of them as well as some pretty beefy transformers so they're heavy i mean i'm not they're and i would say probably 50 60 pounds by the gifts uh, i think that 11.4 would be in that range i think the 10 uh is 40 pounds 10 kw is 40 pounds um so one thing that i'll i'll mention on the on the on these is they like a flat surface. Um, they're really difficult to mount to unless you're able to man, uh, manipulate where, uh, you know, with Unistrut or something, um, your surface behind you. So there's three points of where they get mounted. So either you wanna be on a flat surface, a flat wall. Um, if you try to, if you're looking to mount to a pole, you need to put some Unistrut across it um but there is three points one on the outside or two on the outsides at the top and then there's also once you drop it in on the mounting bracket there's also another mount at the bottom centered on the inverter as well so either unistrut or some sort of flat panel uh flat smooth panel on the back to to mount these inverters make sure you always maintain your minimum clearances too and that's these don't have a fan in there to dissipate the heat it uses the heat sink in the back of it uh, so we've got to have that clearance or we're going to overheat the system so make sure we're always got our minimum clearances uh, between the walls between each other and all that I, I, after you've got your uh, bracket on the wall you're gonna obviously hang the inverter on the bracket. Lift the inverter from the sides or hold it at the top and the bottom up uh, and lift it into place. 
you can lower the inverter on the U shape uh, bracket there on the ends. On uh, you can see on the picture on the right. I let the inverter lay flat against the wall um, or the unit strut or you know whatever you got there. There's two supplied screws, and uh, you're gonna insert insert those through the outer heat sink fin on both sides of the inverter and into the bracket, and then you can torque it down to 2.9 uh, foot pounds or pounds per foot. There's also a DC safety unit bracket. Uh, you can see it kind of in that lower picture there, uh, which is an option. I would recommend it. Uh, basically, you're going to have to remove the inverter from the wall, drill the hole for the bracket, hang the inverter back up, and then uh, use a standard bolt in that bracket hole. Just make sure that they're always uh, secure and tight to the wall uh, and that your bracket is firmly on the wall and that whatever it's hanging on can handle that weight. Connecting string inverters, uh, turn off the AC circuit breaker. There's a little Allen screw on the inverter cover. Uh, remove it and, um, and then you can lower it. On the cabling there, you're gonna have to strip off some and you can, uh, uh, obviously you guys probably figure out how to strip wire off. There is an AC cable gland. You can insert the cable through the gland itself. Um, that'll keep moisture out, that gland will. And then connect the AC wires according to the labels on the terminal block. You can see over there to the right, L and in ground. Um, European, they like to use the L in the N uh, for your power, but it's basically L1, L2, and, and ground, basically what you're looking at. Make sure you've got the wires fully inserted and cannot be pulled out easily. Then after you've got your wires mounted, uh, then you can tighten up the nut on the AC cable gland and that'll seal off uh, any kind of moisture getting in there. Make sure you've got no unconnected wires just flopping out throughout that uh, connection area. If you've got an extra wire for some reason, tuck it up out of the way so it's not going to short anything out when you put that cover back on uh, or you know, cause an issue further down the line. Make sure that all the uh, unused terminal screws are tightened. That way, in case you need to use them at a later point, they don't ha um, you know, come loose and drop in the cabinet and get lost. Uh, so make sure all, all the screws are tightened inside that cabinet. It should be tight when you get it. But you may just want to double check that. Connect the string uh, to the DC input pairs. If required, connect additional strings in parallel using an external uh, common combiner box or branch cables for connecting to the inverters. Excuse me. You can see kind of the uh, the connectors there for the DC. You've got a male and a female connector, and they'll just push together, little push connectors. Here is that on, off, and pairing switch. It's on the bottom of the uh, Solar Edge uh, inverter. So on is obviously on. O is on. One, excuse me. O is off. One is on, and P would be your pairing switch. And then right next to that will be this little looks like a little knob but it'll have a red, a green, and a blue LED on it. And in the manual, based on which ones are flashing and which ones are solid, it'll tell you, you know, if the system's on, if it's in pairing mode, if it's off, if there's a system error. Um, so we're not really gonna get into those lights too much today because I don't expect you to remember what they all mean. There's like four or five little different um, uh, charts that'll tell you the light colors and what they mean. So just check out the manual with the inverter if there is a problem. And again, it'll tell you if it's just on, if it's off, or if it is paired, um, things like that. Here is the communication gland on the 
left picture. And then you can kind of see the AC where it came in, that gland. You can see it's kind of got that little rubber piece in there. So once it tightens up, it tightens down that nut. But you got, again, your communication port. And it'll they'll end up tying into your Ethernet, your USB, your Wi-Fi, or whatever you've got for your internet connection. And there's just uh, there's some dip switches in there if you're using an RS-485 uh, connector. So that would be the six-pin connector there. If you're using that, you've got to use the dip switches. Uh, you've got to move those dip switches so it'll realize that you want to use that connector and not your USB or your Ethernet. There's your communication gland and your board. This is your uh, this is the RJ45 mail plug, and these are stranded wires, and it'll plug right in if you've got if you, this is the connector you're wanting to use. Get the cover off. There's six screws. Loosen those up. Tilt the top off, and then slide slide it down. Uh, and that'll take off the cover for your in or your inverter there. That covers they there's a tab on the bottom of there. Yeah. Um, so do not force it. So <laughs> you, you you simply hinge it back in your wrists and you slip it on the the bottom mm, clip, I guess I'll call it, and and then that's whenever you can flush it up and bring your Allens back in. So um, they're not, I don't want to say fragile, but easily. Uh, can break with force. Yeah, they are plastic, so if it doesn't seem to be fitting properly, don't force it. I mean, they are heavy duty plastic, but still, you can definitely crack them, especially if you're, if it's cold outside and you're outside doing it or something, they get a little bit more fragile. So, this is basically our Solar Edge uh, inverters. They're going to go back to the router. Um, this is how you're going to monitor and set up the system uh, through the internet. Uh, I'll throw in some points on that. Um, yep. I'll first say that uh, hardwire anything is always better. Yes. So it's also always cheaper uh, material. I can't say the same about labor. Um, but if somebody would, um, Solar Edge, for example, does not yet have Wi Fi. Uh, to the inverters. They can use a Zigbee kit. They can use a cellular uh, modem device that they sell, or you can uh, do a hardline LAN uh, connection into the inverter. And uh, well, I guess lastly would be, um, what, do you, what, what number is that? Is it, I can't remember the, uh, oh shoot, the Modbus type connection. Um, is the last one. So basically, basically, you're able to daisy chain the inverters together in a communication uh, path. And but my point is, is that hardline it in if at all possible uh, with a LAN connection. Zigbee's, um, you know, are, are in the range of $500 plus to a consumer, and then a cellular kit. <clears throat> those are only in five or 12 year cell phone plans. And they're in the range of 500 to 1,000 bucks a piece too. And then you got to re them up. So that's just my, uh, you know, kind of two cents on communications. If at all possible, do a LAN connection. I think um, we'll talk about that LAN connection here in just a minute as well. Okay. Um, that's uh, that's that's what I really wanted to concentrate on. But if you needed yep. to go Wi-Fi in, you can also do a, a network extender. Um, so Wi-Fi in to a network extender and then out with a LAN connection. Yep. So this would be if you've got uh, numerous inverters, you've got your master. Uh, you're basically going to pick all the master and you're going to run these are your connectors, your B, A, and G from your RS-485s. Um, basically going to tie them in to the next. You're just going to work your way down the line until you get back to your master terminated. Um, again, this is that solar in, uh, edge inverter. This is actually the one uh, from Sean's house that got hit by lightning. Uh, 
I kind of just want you to see the inner parts of it. The lower portion uh, has got the little switch on it, on off switch, uh, and then your connectors. Over there to the right, I really wanted you to see, this is the back side of that inverter. And you can see that's the heat sink on the back of the inverter. So that's why we gotta have a little bit of clearance along that the back of the unit uh, so we can get rid of that heat. So that's why I really wanted to show you was that, that picture right there. Another reason they're so heavy. Uh, maybe we must talk about that land connection maybe in this solar arc. Uh, this solar arc inverter. <clears throat> now, this will kind of segue into next week's training because this solar arc is a hybrid inverter. And so, this is the one that we will use with the batteries right now that we offer. Now, if you have, if someone's already got a system out there, it's already got an inverter on it, and it's, it could be one that the batteries will work on. The right now, the Feronius, I don't believe. Uh, I know that the AP systems, the Feronius, and I'm not really sure about Solar Edge, but I don't think that they're going to work on those battery on the battery that we're offering right now. I don't want to get too in depth on batteries today, but right. Um, Solar, Edge, Solar Edge has an uh, has a uh, option that we'll talk about uh, next week. Um, AP Systems does not yet, uh, and Fronius uh, is talking about a product that they're going to have. So um, this is our only hybrid inverter option. But um, you know, I'm an underdog fan myself, um, and the Solar is not new but, uh, as, as much, but it's also it's made in Texas. Um, good people to work with. And the the key to a hybrid inverter here is that it's it's cost reduction. Um, and we'll talk about I got a couple slides coming up, but if you're able to remove an inverter from the equation, because you know for, to go from AC to DC or uh, DC to AC, I said that right both times. Um, you have to have an inverter, and so we're trying a hybrid inverter removes the um the uh, be, it being necessary to have more than one inverter which is why this slide here on the left um kind of helps with that the solar so, does have a color touch display on the very front of it it does have a variable speed fan for cooling uh, so we'll have to be vented somewhere. Uh, there is an on-off button on the very front of it. You've got your AC in and out, um, you know, your your loads, your generator, your smart load output. Uh, it's got some battery temperature sensors, auto, auto generator start, rapid shutdown. There's some external uh, sensors. Battery communication again, knockouts. It's got your PV shutoff, uh, PV inputs. So this is the the solar. Again, color touch display. You can kind of see what it's gonna look like, and you can kind of see, you know, what your your kilowatts uh, coming from the panels, what you're you know receiving from the grid, and what's being put into the home and how much is in the batteries. So you can uh, look at your AC in and out, your load in and out, your battery temperature sensor, your auto generator start, rapid shutdown mode, arc fault and ground fault detections, external current sensors, battery communications. It does have grid tied mode, so you can sell your power to the grid. Then you have net zero mode, uh, zero your whole home power. You got time of use, uh, smart loading, AC coupling, peak shaving. Uh, so you can do quite a bit with this inverter here. Uh, That's why we liked it so much. That's why we chose it as a vendor for us. Uh, one thing that I'll point out is is that uh, competitive analysis wise, 
uh, Pika is a brand of a hybrid inverter that uh, also has a battery company, and they were purchased by Generac lately uh, in the last uh, seven to eight months. What well, I found interesting whenever reviewing, um, doing the product management, I guess you could say, um, on the products is that that product that the, the Pika had and Generac purchased doesn't have an autogen start on it. So with a solar converter, I think that that's the ultimate in redundancy for a backup system. So they can have a stackable batteries. That we'll, again, we'll talk about next week um, for up to 222 kilowatt hours um, of, ba of stacked up batteries. And then in addition to PV being able to charge the batteries, you're also able to charge the batteries from a generator. So the batteries will become really the heart of the system. Um, and the generator will be able to kick on at say a 20% when it's, or, or 80% used and then kick off at a certain point as well. So um, just, just some uh, method to the madness of, of what was going through our heads on whenever we selected a product because this one gives us the most range of feature benefit. Yeah. And again, we'll definitely get into this one again next week as we talk about the batteries um, going forward. So some of the installation notes on this inverter is it cannot be mounted outdoors. Do not expose it to moisture. Um, it doesn't have seals and things. It's not ready for, for being located outdoors. So that's one thing different on this inverter than in any of the others is it must be mounted inside. Um, must have a ground, must have a neutral. The PV plus and minus are ungrounded and ground must be bonded to neutral once in the home. So a little bit different than the others, but um, you're also gonna have to decide your critical backup circuits. So you're gonna have to decide which 10 circuits will be on backup power continuously. And they're gonna use a non-GFI breaker to work with a transformer switch. And you can replace a GFI breaker with a normal breaker installing GFI outlets instead. Or you can move the GFI breaker into 10 circuit um, pattern there. And then if applicable, you can uh, combine low load circuits. So. Um, again, we'll talk about this next week, but there is a calculator and thing we can we will use next week. You'll see that uh, so we can decide which circuits that you want power to all the time. And uh, also it'll explain how many batteries you're going to need if those are the circuits that you need all the time. But we'll get into that again a little bit more next week uh, on this inverter uh, going with the batteries. You gotta make sure you keep the inverter amperage uh, limits on the grid, uh, 50 amp continuous, off grid 33 amp, with a peak of 83 amps. You can verify each load circuit by measuring typical and max amps with a clamp on meter. Uh, volts times amps equals watts, just in case you needed to, uh, you know, to figure out what the watt is. If you know your amps and you know the voltage, you can just do the math and it'll tell you what the watts are. If you have an arc fault or a GFI breaker in your main panel, we recommend that you install a sub panel for your backup loads and not a transfer switch. Mounting the transfer switch, uh, not valid for arc fault or GFI breakers. But basically, you're going to turn off your main breaker, connect the white neutral wire to the neutral bar. You can kind of see it in the picture over there to the right. Connect the ground wire to the ground bar. Remove the load wire from the circuit breaker and connect it to the black A wire on your uh, that, that sub panel there. And then repeat steps four through five to, uh, for circuit A. Um, 
we probably should use six of wire. You can use four, but um, we recommend six. Always put a strain relief in the wiring going in and out of the solar arc. Ground and neutral wires must be wired as shown to the left or damage will occur. Uh, conduit must be used for the AC wires going to and from the solar arc. And do not connect the grid to the load output breaker and cause damage. Uh, you can next you're gonna install a double pull 50 amp breaker in the main panel for your grid in and out. It's the best practice to install at the opposite end of the bus bar from the main breaker. Uh, mount the solar arc, the actual inverter itself. Obviously, you're gonna have to take in consideration your minimum clearances, six inches on the sides, not really too worried about the back. Make sure it's protected from moisture and extreme heat. So no outdoor, no attic, uh, we'll avoid the warranty. I wouldn't put it in a crawl space either. Uh, again, moisture issues in crawl spaces. There, this one weighs 75 pounds. So make sure that whatever you're mounting it to can support that and that you have two people to lift it. You may even want three people, two people to lift it and one person to mount it once it's lifted. So the other two people can hold it in place, but uh, you could definitely get away with two people, but I wouldn't do it with less than two people. Obviously you're gonna uh, fix the mounting board first to the wall. There's six or eight screws into the studs. Uh, then use the uh, two, two screws, uh, the type uh, to mount the um, uh, bottom portion of that solar inverter. Wiring, uh, when the transport switch on the solar is in the gen position, this means that the circuit is being powered by the inverter, which can use either grid, solar, battery, or generator automatically. So when it's in the gen position, that's where it needs to be because the inverter will decide what it's gonna run off of based on what it's seeing. So our, if it's obviously not getting power off the panels, then it's not going to be in solar mode. If it sees that it's not getting power from the grid either, then it'll probably turn on your generator. So that's how it's going to work. Uh, if you don't have any power in your batteries, you know, if, if we don't have it at the grid, we don't have it on our panels, and we, we have it at our battery, then it's going to use the battery. If we don't have it at the battery, then it's going to use the generator. So uh, that's how it's gonna, it, it's gonna decide what it's gonna do. And that's exactly what this solar arc is supposed to do. It's gonna put it in the gen position, the solar arc will take care of the rest. If you're not installing a transfer switch, so you're off grid or you have a 50 amp sub, pan, sub load panel, you can wire the load output for the solar arc directly to the main lug uh, on your sub panel as long as it's rated for at least 50 amps. So in the off-grid mode, uh, we wouldn't have that transfer switch. Connecting the batteries, make sure that it's powered off, but connect the batteries to the solar as shown in the diagram there. Now figure A, install includes Faraday's on the battery input cables, slide the fer ferrite over the battery cables so that both cables are within it. Uh, when connecting for a first time, use the included 100 ohm uh, resistor to pre-charge the inverter for 30 seconds before connecting the six foot cable to the solar. Uh, you can kind of see in, in figure uh, D there, you've got the little resistor. And make sure that we're not reversing polarity on the batteries. Damage will occur. Basically, on that resistor, you're going to hold the resistor so that it contacts the free battery cable in the battery terminal, uh, completing the circuit. You can either do it by hand or you can do it with the clamps. 
um, it's not going to shop dip. You don't have to really worry about that too much. Solar panel install. Um, we have the Solar 8, that's the 8K. There's 8K and a 12K. Uh, the 8K has two separate pairs of solar panel inputs. So it's a dual MPPT. There is a chart in the manual that you can use to determine how many strings of panels and how many panels per string can be installed. Uh, so you have to check out that chart. It's only a guide. Um, there are certain panel types and configurations that can be compatible within system specs. The max PV input is 11,000 watts per system. Uh, 6,000 per MPPT and uh, 500 on the PV. Connect the strings of solar panels to the system uh, uh, shown. I think I've got it on the next page or something here. We'll get that in just a second. Uh, and then each pair of strings must be the uh, same voltage if both are used. So if you've got a PVA and uh, 1A and PV2A, they must be the same voltage. If you're gonna use panel frame grounding, it can be done on any ground in the home via 12 AUG wire. The mounts usually bond the frames together, so only one ground wire is needed. Here is a basically a little layout of what the system, what you're gonna have, the wiring, wiring sizes that are recommended. So we've got obviously your solar panels, your rapid shutdown boxes, your solar uh, inverter, your battery bank, your generator input, your backup AC output, uh, your breaker for your grid. Um, so this is basically a little layout of the complete system with the solar and they do recommend or do show your recommended wire and breaker sizing there as well. Connecting the port portable backup generator, 240 volt only. So generators that are smaller than 10 kW, you're going to connect to the generator output to the generator input breaker on the solar panel. So again, back here on the left side of this diagram. Again, only 240 volt generators are supported. If off grid connect, uh, if off grid connect the generator output to the grid input of the solar, and then select the gen connection to grid input option in the self control tab when you go to set up the uh, the controller there. Uh, standby generators, uh, 10kW. If off grid, you can connect the generator output directly to the grid input and it will proceed with the generator as if it were the grid. You will need to select the gen uh, connected to grid input when you go in to set it up as well. Uh, and off grid, you will have grid sell off and without the need for a current limiting sensors. Uh, so you can basically go in there and set that up again in the uh, installer setup. There are some sensors and accessories. Uh, we have limiter sensors. They're gonna be installed on the incoming electrical service wires uh, and they're required as selling power uh, to a whole home. We have battery temperature sensors. They're placed between the batteries they're not required if you're using lithium batteries, which that's what our batteries are, so. Uh, the CAN bus and the R4, RS-485 connectors, in order to connect batteries to the solar, you'll need to splice the ends of the, connect, of the connectors uh, to the solar. Gen, generator start signal. It's a normally open relay that closes when the generator start state is active. 
if your generator only starts at the loss of voltage to the generator, we suggest using a double pole single throw relay uh, to the output of the inverter. The PV rapid shutdown signal, it's basically a 12 volt signal. Uh, power is present until the solar arc is shut down uh, with the front button on it. And then again, there is a Wi Fi antenna and on the inverter. And that's only needed if you're going to, uh, for remote monitoring, like if you've got, you want to look at things on your phone or for any type of uh, software updates. Testing and powering up the solar arc. Again, check voltage at each PV input circuit. Should be no higher than 500 volts DC open circuit. And do not connect PV plus or PV minus to the ground. It's always obviously good to verify your polarity. Check your grid input voltage. They're normally shown for North America. Ensure that 120 volts AC is the L1 in neutral and L2 in neutral. Ensure that there's 240 volts between L1 and L2. And make sure that neutral and ground have zero volts AC. You can also check your uh, battery voltage, turn the battery switch on, and voltage should be between 45 and 57 volts, and that's a DC voltage. If all that checks out okay, you can go ahead and turn on the breakers for the grid and the load. Uh, turn PV disconnect knob to on. At that time, your system's gonna boot up with power from the PV grid or the battery. After that happens, you can go ahead and press the uh, on off button on the front of the inverter and the light should come on. Um, if you installed limit sensors, uh, it's you need to verify the performance of those as well. Go ahead and check with an AC uh, multimeter, verify L1 voltage on A1 on AC in and out is zero uh, with the main L1 connection on the panel and again on L2. Then go through and verify your sensors. Uh, try removing one sensor from the L1 connector and again, the power should drop to zero. So here's basically where we're gonna start setting it all up. Basic setup, uh, we'll go over it a little bit, but not a whole lot. I don't expect you to remember how to set these up. There is a startup, startup in the manual, and then you can either set it up with basic, or you can go in there and set it up you know, through Wi-Fi and all that, uh, and you'll see some pictures here in a minute of how that actually works. But on basic setup, there's a display. You can, I would, the auto dim must be enabled for LCD screen to be covered under warranty. So color LCD screen dim if left on uh, for continuously for years. So uh, make sure you're setting that up properly. You can set up a date and time for the system. Obviously you need to program your battery sizing uh, the percent of voltages that you want it to drop to, and uh, so your your charge and your discharge percentages. We'll talk about that next week, the battery stuff. Uh, make sure you're properly setting up the battery type. Uh, again, we'll cover some of that battery stuff next week. I don't want to um, ruin it for you for next week. <laughs> Grid setup. Uh, make sure you're setting it up to either cell, uh, uh, to the grid, or if it's going to limit the power produced by a system to match the demand of the home. Uh, so there are different ways you can go about setting up how you're going to set it up to, uh, you know, sell back to the grid or receive power from the grid. There is remote monitoring. Uh, on this monitoring, there is a link in the manual that actually tell you that link as well. Um, but it'll help you kind of set up. You can uh, remote monitor it through Wi-Fi. You can use, um, uh, you can hard, you can hard wire into the, into the controller and, 
and set it up that way as well. If you do have to, if you want to set it up Wi-Fi, you will have to go in and put these passwords in um, and use different usernames and you can get into those uh, parameters and set up your Wi-Fi. If you would like to do that, I would recommend checking out the YouTube video here. Uh, I need to update that link. It seems to be broken there. So I'll get that changed. And again, it is in the manuals as well. And you can, you can watch it there, how to set up the Wi-Fi monitoring. Once on the Wi-Fi monitoring, these are different steps. It'll walk you right through it. Uh, it's really pretty simple. But if you have any questions when you're setting this up, definitely give us a call and we can you know, help you kind of walk through it as well. So again, we'll cover a lot of the Solark again next week when we get into the uh, battery stuff. So that's what we have for today. I'm sure you guys have questions. So um, definitely ask questions. If we can't get them answered for you, if you get a question later on today, shoot me an email and we'll get you taken care of. So uh, ask away. I, I have a comment while everybody's uh, uh, typing in their questions. I do want to say too that that hybrid inverter from Solark, their their products do not have to have a battery. So they're great just to, they're a little bit more pricey, obviously, but they're great because you, if somebody's planning to add a battery uh, in the near future, relatively near future, they can add the battery later at any point and not have nearly the install costs um, that they don't have to pay for another inverter. So for now, you can just use it as a PV inverter only and then add a battery down the road. Well, John, um, we have one question um, that we haven't already answered uh, directly. Um, can you please exp uh, expand on the emergency disconnects on the roof? Is there an actual switch or how is power killed past microinverters? You want me to handle that one or do you feel good with it? Um, <laughs> On that one then, um, so you don't actually have a switch up on the roof. Uh, depending on where you're at in the world, actually, there might be a required physical switch, but this is all automated automatically. So if these inverters don't feel the grid, they use either the optimizer um, has a gateway that it per, uh, essentially uh, prevents the power from passing through it and then the optimizer or the um, I'm sorry the micro inverter inverter on the roof will shut down it, it senses AC all the way up to the roof therefore if it doesn't feel the grid powering it it'll automatically shut off up there at the roof as well so it won't let any DC power slip through the inverter up there within a, just a few feet of the solar panel itself Well, that's it for today. We've already kept you quite a long time. So, John, you'll close this out uh, for next week. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate your time and uh, stay safe and healthy. And um, we'll see you guys next week.